Welcome to Good News, Bad News, the Libertarian Christian Roundtable, where every other week we challenge the status quo and give you the libertarian Christian analysis of what's happening in your world. Welcome back to our roundtable. We have Norman Horn, Carrie Baldwin, and Aaron Sepulveda Quay. Uh, if I pronounce your name right. Okay, good. I got it. I've never Close. had the <laughs> point of the you, Aaron. Um, and so we are going to talk about the news that impacts you and uh, that you've heard about. And, you know, what's interesting is that we actually live in a world where the Cuomo family is completely unemployed. And therefore, that seems like good news. Um, and there's other good news that people are getting excited about, at least maybe theoretically. A lot of conservatives and pro-lifers are really excited about the Supreme Court potentially overturning Roe. Uh, that's at least the sort of, you know, get you to click on their emails headline that a lot of people <laughs> yeah. or subject line that a lot of conservative organizations are sending you uh, right now. But we so we'll Carrie. do it, too. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> yes, we're going to do that, too, because, <laughs> you know, it gets opens. Right. Um, so, you know, carry for next email we send. Let's make that our subject line. Yeah. Um, oh, doesn't matter what the content is. Yeah, we can, yeah. Like, it could be about Bitcoin or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're just gonna, we're gonna exploit abortion. So yeah. you're you're actually my go-to person on like what the heck is going on <laughs> and whether or not there's a hype involved, uh, what the hype is all about. Uh, yeah. because I don't have time to digest all of the articles about this. And of course, I don't trust most of the corporate media. So uh, mm -hmm. give us uh give us what's going on. Yeah, so I first of all, I think that there is definitely some hype going on. Um, so it's the Mississippi abortion law that is um, being discussed right now by the Supreme Court. And as I understand it, actually, the Texas abortion law is also being considered, um, although not officially together, I'm sure. Um, but so the Mississippi law is basically a law that, that bans abortion after 15 weeks. So Mississippi wants to make viability um, instead of 24 weeks, they want to make it 15. Um, and so there's, you know, if, if ostensibly, if the Supreme Court upholds the Mississippi law, all they're doing is changing the uh, the point of viability. And this actually is probably where Justice Roberts wants to go. Um, he's one of the uh, conservative appointed justices that doesn't appear to be open to the idea of, of overturning Roe. And some of his questions during the hearing suggested that maybe all they should do is, um, you know, adjust Roe so that uh, instead of viability being at 24 weeks, it could be at 15 weeks. Um, although, again, they're also exploring the the uh, Texas abortion law, which effectively bans after six weeks, but that's not a criminal matter. It's a civil matter, and so technically doesn't even fall under row, which is which is interesting. So the reason why there's a lot of hype about this is because nobody knows where Amy Con Coney Barrett, is that her name? Middle name? I forget. Anyways, Barrett. Uh, um, and Denver version two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and um, and Kavanaugh, nobody knows where, the, where those two are really going to fall on this. They're expecting both of them to uh, sort of side with the other conservative justices who have made comments about how they think Roe v. Wade would, you know, was 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 a uh, bad precedent and should be overturned. So if that's the case, then uh, and this is what the media is saying is that there is potentially five Supreme Court justices who are, quote unquote, poised to not just uphold the Mississippi law, but take this as an opportunity to overturn Roe entirely. Um, and the media is kind of going nuts about this. Uh, I noticed actually one report, one report actually uh, almost blames Ruth Bader Ginsburg for dying and <laughs> and, and making this opening this, this door. Sorry. It is. It terrible. really is. Um, you know, <laughs> it's because she died that it gave Trump the opportunity to appoint Barrett. And so now. 
uh, n- now women's rights are screwed, basically, so, is, is how they, they're so framing hang on. that. Let's say that she didn't die and she's still on the Supreme Court. Would there still be a majority in the direction that they don't want? That's the interesting thing is because Ginsburg... Didn't Trump, Trump d- appoint more than one? He did. Oh. I think he appointed three, if I recall. Yeah, I'm just not re- Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, at any rate, but what's interesting about Ginsburg is that Ginsburg always thought that Roe v. Wade was was a bad decision, that it should she was pro she was pro choice. She favored abortion, but she never she always thought that uh, Roe v. Wade should never have been decided by the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it would be interesting for her to be uh you know if she were still alive mm-hmm. to be looking at this decision because for for her entire career she thought roe v wade was was bad precedent do you but, do you know what it would when people say overturn roe you know i imagine all my life i've imagined oh man if we overturn roe v wade it would be similar to the way that the constitutional amendment that abolished prohibition would be like a declared thing But it doesn't Mm -hmm. seem like that would actually be what happens. It's not like the court would say we were wrong in 1973 or whatever year it was. Uh, We were wrong in the 70s and therefore this is our new decree. It doesn't work that way. So what would this even look like per se? Because it doesn't seem like it's on the table to define viability to zero weeks, right? Yeah. So um, basically it sort of depends on, well, what it would do if you, if we overturned Roe, what it would do is just kick the issue back to the states. Now, there are some states that actually still have laws on the books, abortion bans on the books that predate mm-hmm. Roe that were just sort of... They just, um, they're just still there. Yeah, they they were effectively nullified by Roe. Yeah, by the federal government. <laughs> right. Um, in practice, I guess you could say. There are other states who have, since Roe, enacted something called trigger laws, um, which basically say if Ro- if Roe v. Wade is overturned uh, in whole or in part, then this then there will there's an automatic ban that will go into effect roughly 30 days after the Supreme Court's decision. So you have some states that just have old bans in place that would um, uh, that that would then be active once again. Um, if Roe was overturned, you would have some of these states with uh, their trigger laws would take effect. But then you have some states like New Mexico, California, New York, some of the, the more liberal states who have already repealed their old abortion bans. Um, New Mexico just did it. Uh, I think it was this year they repealed their uh, the old abortion ban so that if Roe ever did get overturned, it wouldn't uh it, it wouldn't affect abortion access within the state so you have some states that have actually passed laws saying regardless of what happens to roe they're going to recognize abortion rights in the state so <clears throat> potentially what i'm hearing is that there are up to 26 states that uh could ban abortion outright if roe v wade were overturned um i'm not sure how many blue states or how many states generally um, are willing to uphold Roe. Uh, a lot of the headlines are talking about California being a uh, abortion sanctuary state. Uh, um, I'm sure New, New York would be the same way. Um, but that's that's sort of the interesting thing. I mean, we've already talked about ideas like se- secession and just the deep divide between uh, conservatives and progressives and what's going on with that. And so potentially if Roe v. Wade is overturned, which I'm skeptical about, um, you're going to have this really uh, sort of patchwork uh, map of where abortion is legal and where it's not. Um, I'm sort of of the opinion that Roe v. Wade is about more than just making abortion legal. It's about the state's interest in a woman's body. And so... Um, especially since, uh, especially since we haven't heard anything more from from the court, any other hints from the court, um, I'm sort of skeptical about the idea that Roe will be overturned. I'm inclined to think that they'll uphold the Mississippi law, but I'm not sure that they are ready to let go of the power that Roe v. Wade gives them um, over a woman's 
body and a woman's liberty interest. And, uh, you know, by upholding the Mississippi law, they're also putting a, uh, a, a stricter restriction on uh, a woman's li- liberty interest in her own body and in bodily autonomy. And I'm not sure where this court would stand on vaccine mandates, but if they favor vaccine mandates, restricting bodily autonomy and agency um, could be a way of uh, setting some sort of court precedent for vaccine mandates. So a future Supreme Court case that comes up because someone refuses to follow a vaccine mandate sues the government mm-hmm. and it makes its way to the Supreme Court, they could say, oh, the ruling in 2022, which is when this is this one that we're talking about right now is going to come down, says that the state has an interest in mandating what people could do with their bodies. Therefore, that's the law. Like, yeah. we'll uphold the man, a vaccine mandate. Yeah, I'm incredibly skeptical about what's going to happen. You know, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that that the Supreme Court will uh, just suddenly overturn Roe. I mean, I've we've talked about it before on this podcast. It's conservative uh, appointed justices who made Roe possible and who have uh, uh, up, upheld abortion rights. Yeah, but Carrie, isn't this what the Q prophecy as to why Trump was elected was gonna it was gonna overturn Roe? (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) But but does it really overturn Roe? Like I guess that's that's sort of like Yeah, I'm a little concerned that people are I don't understand. Yeah, I mean explain explain me. So what they're saying what they're saying is is that um there are five Supreme Court justices that might go further than just upholding the Mississippi law and instead of merely upholding the Mississippi law which they could do and say that that's aligned with Roe they're just moving the point of viability um they're saying the the speculation is that those five Supreme Court justices will just go ahead and take the opportunity opportunity to overturn Roe entirely yeah so it would be it would be of my opinion uh just opinion that 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 seems that seems like you said entirely unlikely yeah i think (laughs) it's wouldn't that be uh, like definite uh political activism from the bench or that would uh, be legislating from the bench in a way i mean i guess it is about its own president roe Roe was legislating from the bench and so i mean on its face it should be overturned the problem is is that everybody thinks that roe v wade is about abortion first and it's not it's about a yeah. state's interest it's about the state's interest in the woman's body and in in uh in the fetus's body it's a foundational mm-hmm. argument that allows abortion it right. isn't about abortion directly exactly well, and it was about abortion directly i didn't mean it that way but and um you know it's about whether or not the state can restrict uh the liberty interest that a woman has in her body and certainly you know uh the principle of equality under the law anything that applies to women would apply to to men generally speaking too so um i could see them using this actually as a way to restrict liberty interest further in Mm -hmm. in bodily autonomy and agency and that i think is is dangerous what i expect will happen is that they'll uphold the mississippi law they won't overturn roe um, abortion activists, <clears throat> excuse me, pro-life activists um, who are incrementalists will call this a major victory. Yeah. And uh, Democrats will use it to uh, to fight Trump and or the GOP candidates in the midterms and in the next presidential election. They'll make it their centerpiece. So um, I'm wow. I am concerned that it could uh, fragment libertarians further um, if it's even if the Mississippi law is upheld. Um, if, if Roe v. Wade is overturned, I would say libertarians in those states that it becomes criminalized in need to actively pursue criminal justice reform and deregulation of the economy and not waste their tr- waste their time trying to uh, you know, make abortion legal again in those states. But yeah. you know how the Libertarian Party is, so. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. What a what an awkward note to go out on on that topic. Uh-huh. The Libertarian Party? We have to... <laughs> yeah. 
Well, it, it, there are plenty of there are plenty of good folks there too, but it, it is sort of a foregone conclusion that there's not really much that the LP is going to be able to do on it. So, yeah. what's the point? <laughs> well, I, I guess I guess my point is that you already have libertarians who are infighting over a number of of things, yeah. and you know this will just be another one of those things. It's part of our DNA. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. Well, I, I know that the uh, we fight over hairs. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the the Supreme Court ruling here is about, you know, especially Roe is about the the interest that the state has in in a woman's body. And I think one takeaway that I kind of have in this whole discussion about this is like, and I don't know this is going to sound so cliche and so simple and so duh, but it's like the state is bad no matter what decisions it makes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's just got negative consequences for a lot of people. It's like, right. I, I'm just like, this is, this is a, you know, damned if you do damned, if you don't kind of situation when, when you deal with the state making decisions about your life. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah. So I, I don't know how to segue onto the next topic. So we'll just jump <laughs> into it. Um, it's just like, I don't know, you know, talking about that is, is, you know, it's a sensitive topic and you know, you don't want to, you don't want to you, you want to do it justice uh, as we have that conversation the um the misinformation that is happening around the the economy is kind of driving me crazy you know i hear people <laughs> talk about like um I, I even had a friend say that uh only it only takes 15 percent of the wealth of the top 10 percent to pay off the national debt and i'm like dude do you even math <laughs> like, like he even said that he did uh but anyway I, I don't actually know i'm like well wait a second how do, how does that work like really 29 trillion dollars so there's just a lot of misinformation and assumptions about like what even inflation is i mean norm i think you met so you you were interacting with somebody online uh who was like <laughs> oh, a little misinformed about inflation and what's going on and energy and like it's just all up in the air and you know, it's all Biden's fault, right? Like every single bit of it's Biden's fault. Every single. I mean, he's just at the computer making yeah, changes to just, the economy. He's, on his keyboard. he's punching the inflation button on his, on his <laughs> like, console. Do it. In the, in the, do in it. The Oval I, I have the do it. Did that work? Yeah. Nope. Yeah, do it again. Nope. Do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Press the big red button. So for what, inflation, what, please. Norm, what have you seen out there? Well, I, I think it's interesting. I, we're beginning to see the, uh, I, I think the, the kind of the ramp up to midterms and even 2024 election, even though it's barely we're only a month in, you know, a month away from 2022 itself. But I think the uh, the the be the beginnings of the rhetoric are coming clear. And, you know, we're going to hear about covid. We're going to hear about abortion. We're going to hear about China and we're going to hear a lot about inflation. The number one uh, thing in, in kind of economic issues that is going to be the hot button topic in 2022 for midterm elections is going to be inflation. And and make no mistake, there's it, there was plenty of blame to go around for everything. But one what, what I am definitely hearing from certain people is very confused with regards to causes and symptoms about what inflation is, how it starts and how it proceeds. And Aaron and I have talked a lot about this we continue uh, to learn together and study the phenomena. Uh, and, and so I wanted to bring forward a few things that I've seen most recently that are a little weird here. In particular, I've noted um, one, and I'm going to share this on my screen here uh, for everybody to see. Let's see if I can get this up. Uh, you know, so this article that I, I want to kind of share from The Hill uh, suggests a few particular things about inflation that are a little weird. In um, the most important piece of it, being that they're very uh, centered on the supply chain uh, being a, a, a the supply chain problems as being a cause, as well as the uh, uh, the uptick in energy prices, and that's you know pretty significant. And they they pinpoint that in two ways, or or to or they pinpoint the problem in, in two other two two ways. One is that the Biden administration is is responsible for the supply chain problem, which is very strange off the top, and then secondarily that Biden is responsible for energy prices going up, period. Um, now, on one level, that might have there's some there's some credence to that, uh, that 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 uh, in particular, that the in, that in 
um, that Biden's energy policy is responsible for these this uptick in in energy prices. But that is not me. That is not inflation per se. That's just supply and demand going up and down. Uh, and so that's interesting in and of itself uh, is that that what they're trying to kind of pin as inflation is really just a supply demand problem. But, you know, the supply shock uh, element aside from the the aspects of of uh, the energy policy, which include things like the Keystone Pipeline being shut down, uh, the de- decrease in oil production, and uh, and it's it's odd because you even you even see like OPEC uh, resisting Biden saying please increase production after he demanded essentially that U.S. production go down. So it's it's all weird, and and you know so no doubt the Biden administration's policy is pure idiocy. Uh, No, no doubt about that, but it's not the cause of inflation. This is where it gets kind of more interesting. Um, So there's, and of course there's plenty of other, of other articles to this effect. Uh, We can go to Bloomberg and see, you know, likewise that there's a, there's plenty of, uh, you know, of information showing that we're at 40 year highs for inflation. They haven't seen anything like this since the eighties. Uh, and then, of course, pinning it on pinning it on Biden, uh, it's going to be a huge issue. The Wall Street Journal reports the same sort of thing, and is and is even asking, well, what's the cause of inflation? But then it says uh, strange things like, well, it's uh, you know, uh, inflation is one of the most vexing problems facing economists and government policymakers. <laughs> oh, geez, that's great. But then this just says inflation reflects the broad rise of prices or the fall in the value of money it's like oh that's really um, and it results from too too much demand chasing too few goods or limited services resulting in price increases aaron my brother how wrong how do, are they <laughs> how, how how do we get so much demand that's what i want to know yeah yeah mm. exactly so hey. So the issue is is not merely uh, is not merely one of well energy prices are going up therefore inflation uh, mm-hmm. that's that's and and perhaps isn't isn't the perfect wording to kind of go at this but remember just we should remember that these things are symptomatic of inflation and not the direct causes and that inflation is a monetary phenomenon uh, and so and that which is resulting from the increasing in, of the money supply. And so if we want to start tracking back the causes, we need to start looking at where's all the surplus, where's all the cash coming from? You know, as, as Peter Schiff liked to say, and, you know, went back when back when I thought, well, I, I love Peter Schiff. He's wrong on Bitcoin, but he's the, uh, but the good parts of, of uh... the, the excellent part of Peter Schiff was when he was, when he'd say, was, you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> Con- was it Congress got drunk, but where but who gave him the alcohol? Yeah, right. it was a, it was the great phrase that he that, that he said, great. and the alcohol is the Federal Reserve, and right. the increase in the money the supply that comes from cheap money policy. So, and so, Aaron, what do you think? Uh, is this is this kind of do, do you, uh, what are you seeing out there that's of similar of similar ilk uh, and misexplanations of uh, of inflation in general? And what the, do you what do you think is the the right way to go about teaching people the right the right way? The best way the best way to see it is in developed economies with a very stable, relatively stable currency, uh, the velocity of that developing country currency is going to be stable, the demand for cash balance is going to be stable. Therefore, every time there's something like a supply shock, there's less supply of goods and services or a slowdown, if you wish. Yes, prices of those markets are start going to be going up because there's less and so that's just the way it is yeah so could they'll bid up prices that's the way it goes demand's exactly. gonna stay the same there you go but as we see prices of one sector like energy sector go up we are gonna have to spend more on energy and less therefore less less on, on other sectors everything else so yeah. the prices of the other products have to come down unless we have extra money to literally pay for the higher price of energy without reducing spending on the other on the other so that when we say that the money supply causes prices to rise what we mean is or that inflation is always a monetary phenomenon is that as some prices go up for whatever happens to the supply chain in those sectors 
people are going to have to start spending less on those uh, either in that sector, just because prices are so high and that you have to move some, some, someplace else, or if they do pay the higher prices, they have to start spending less on every other sector. So those prices, on average, because that's, that's what we tend to be concerned with when we talk the value of money or the purchasing power, we're talking about the general cost of uh, the cost of living. It's not going to go up because some prices are going to go up and other ones have to go down to compensate the fact that we don't have money to literally pay for everything unless we actually do have yeah. the money to pay for all of the raise, all of the rising prices. The question is, if prices are rising, why are we paying those high prices? Why are we not accommodating within a week or within a month yeah. to change our, uh, our lifestyles so as to not pay the high prices? Why? Because we happen to have the, uh, the cash available. If, can I show some graphs, guys? Yeah. yeah, man. Let's bring it up. Okay. So for the ones in the audio, I'll try to do my best to describe what's going <laughs> on. Okay. So um, some of the graphs that I have here. The first one is, if you guys, I have it as proportional. Let's say we started on uh, the er early 20, uh, 2019. This is proportional. Uh, this is like an index. So these are not the actual numbers, but they kind of go together if you wish. So as you guys can see, right in the middle of the recession that we had for two weeks, as everybody knows, the months of April and March and April were the, 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 the economic contraction. Every other month except one has been economic expansion, but super slow. That's why that's the whole point of saying the supply chain slow down. It's not like it stop, but it's slow down. That's kind of what we mean. The money supply, as everybody should know by now, it increased like crazy, like never before. Uh, don't worry about the fact that this is M2. This is uh, banking money, but behind that is the Federal Reserve. So you don't have to. So it goes up like crazy. What happens in the middle of the recession during those two months, uh, March and April? Personal consumption, that's what I want you guys to pay attention is how do we get pr consumer prices to be beat up, it's because we have money to beat up those prices. So our spending in consumer prices has to rise. Right in the middle, we didn't see other. We didn't see uh, infl inflation is the green one. If you guys see somewhat stable relative to the other ones, we didn't see it go up until we started to spend so much in consumption that mm -hmm. that started to beat up the prices of. Yeah. Of, of consumer prices. That's when you actually can see, let's say around January of, of, of this year, that's when you start seeing the speed up of, uh, of consumer prices. But why? Because we happen to have the money, the money's in existence to actually uh, beat up the prices of all those consumer products like never before. So that's what can, I want you to do. Can you that's scroll over to the right a little bit further so I can see what's gonna happen next year? <laughs> I wish. Right? I really do wish. <laughs> I could. <laughs> uh, yeah, to the to the right, what he's about to show is a is a little rocket and a Bitcoin symbol going to a moon. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, got it. So, <laughs> so far, is this understandable? It's yes. It's not just they create money and then prices shoot up. Okay, no, that's not how it happens. Yeah, it's money goes up, and if that money goes into consumer markets, then the prices of consumer goods is, are are going to go up. Later on, if we ever have time, we'll talk about the uh, Austrian business cycle theory, that the problem is not so much that money goes into consumer price, is that it does not go into consumer price. It goes into early or investment uh, markets. Yeah. And then those prices go up and they distort the structure of production. But so you guys understand what's going on with consumer price inflation is the money that was created a significant portion compared to before. Uh, mainly because of the stimulus and, and, and bunch of other and government spending because it, it's very close to consumption. It's going to go into consumption markets. That money is going to go there. It's actually going to be used for the, those type of and it's going to be uh, bidding up uh, consumer price. It's going to try to speed up the the supply chain. And obviously, we cannot speed it up just like crazy. So, so far, so good, right? Mm -hmm. Can you guys see it? Yep. yep. Yeah. Okay. So now the next one is just comparing personal consumption with total spending. Gross domestic product is just the monetary spending we've done uh, since, let me put it, 2019. There you go. 
Yeah. As you go. guys can see, uh, as we go into the recession, we consume a lot less for the two uh, for the two months that we had the the contraction. Then we had the 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 re the recovery the of quick consumption. recovery. Yeah. The recovery it's much much faster. And what kind of spending? Total spending, including government spending, investment, net exports, and consumption. Or which one's the one that is going faster? It is consumption spending. Why is it going so much faster than than uh, than the total way? Because we happen to have the money available to do that. Yeah. We're cash stacked. That's that's what. what so we're what, what so we're it? all sitting on cash surpluses basically because of uh, because of government handouts. Because I, of I mean, exa it, yeah, exactly or stimulus really. Yeah. Well, you see, this is the issue. They yeah. created money, then they actually send it to consumers. Consumers are going to go out and spend it. And yeah. guess what? We actually did, and that mm -hmm. speed up a very weak supply chain that already had trouble because of the energy issues, uh, because of the social distancing stuff, so on and so forth. So it was the perfect combination f uh, uh, for consumer prices to start shooting up. But then that the, connect, the monetary connection is consumption spending. How did that consumption spending happen? Well, the money had to be created. So as I was saying on the, uh, I said before is the monetary expansion is necessary for consumer prices to shoot up, but not sufficient. Yeah. The point is that this time they got the new money created and they found a way through fiscal stimulus to get it to consumers and consumers are going to go out and spend and buy consumer goods. That's what consumers do, literally. Um, so this is the best way. So monetary is the, the reason behind, and, and you can go backwards. If you, if you take out, you, uh, reduce the mo the money supply then there is less money to buy consumer goods and then what's going to happen guess what's going to happen to consumer uh yeah. to consumer price they're going to start having to go down so we just went way too fast it was completely irrational to think that the all the stimulus were going to actually end up making up uh, that the supply chain was going to catch up to all the stimulus there was just no conceivable way that the supply chain is going to is going to catch up to so much uh new monetary expansion plus the fiscal stimulus that specifically are really, really close to consumer markets and they're going to end up bidding up consumer price and trying to accelerate like crazy, something that cannot be accelerated, accelerated where, uh, where we're at right now, which is the supply chain. So yes, it's not just money and prices go up. We should be careful to explain it that way, but without the money creation, this could not be happening. So that's, that's what we mean that inflation is always a monetary phenomenon without, without the money, we could not have it because it's ne although not sufficient, it's definitely necessary for that to happen. Yep. Well, that's a that's probably the best way to to get around this right now. So now you know. Now you know, and uh, keep yeah, keep learning and reading about that so you can explain it to your friends and family as this. Uh, uh, because I know that around your, you know, Christmas table that you're going to be asked. <laughs> you all, you libertarians are going to be asked, "What's the cause of inflation?" <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's going to be the the hot. The hot dinner topic, but uh, hey, you know, if, if it's not, you'll you be know, prepared. you know what really should be the hot dinner topic, though. Ah, oh, oh, there yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. I mean, book, I'll, Faith Seeking yeah, that's Freedom. Right. That's for right. Audio yeah. listeners, says, uh, <laughs> you know, you can you can get it on Amazon. You go to faithseekingfreedom.com, libertarianchristians.com. Uh, you can get the audio book. It's actually really cheap right now as a holiday special as an audio book on libertarianchristians.com slash store. Nice. Um, and you can also get some other available things there. So, and right. we are not inflating the price. The price is the same. A actually, we deflated the price. Yeah, yeah. actually, we've been yeah. deflating the price, not because <laughs> of the value, but because we're we, being more productive. We're being more productive. <laughs> <laughs> so the supply chains have nothing on us. So. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> nope, I've I got I got a nice supply right right over here. We so, got the, um, the yeah, the good supply. <laughs> yeah, so if you if you're a listener of the roundtable and you want to get two copies of Faith Seeking Freedom, uh, LZ has a five hundred one c three nonprofit, and if you donate to us, we can send you a free gift, uh, and that free gift is two copies with bookmarks inside. <laughs> which you can't get on Amazon and um, they will one for you, one for a friend, um, depending on how the U S postal service handles things. It might or might not get here by Christmas. So, <laughs> um, but you can get a Kindle copy for pretty inexpensive and you can also download the audiobook from our website. Awesome. Well, 
that's a that sounds like a sounds like a great place to kind of end off. Yeah, at, it sure does. Place. And if you're <laughs> if for some reason you haven't already subscribed to the Libertarian Christian podcast, which is our other mainstay uh, podcast. Um, you can you can do that on uh, all of your good pod catchers or whatever you do to listen to or listen to us at uh, libertarianchristians.com. Thanks, oh, and everyone. we also have to say before we go, you know, blah, 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 uh, like and subscribe and all that nice jazz. If you're watching us on YouTube, right. we do appreciate yes. it. Let us know. Send us something in the comments. And write a if you review, a question or whatever. Write a yeah. review yeah, on write your write podcast app. That actually helps people know that that this is good. Good for them to listen to. Yeah, we, we had no plan for talking about this stuff at the end, but we're doing it anyway. But we're having a good time. Uh, we yeah. do we do appreciate you, it's actually everybody very listening. And uh, but we will we'll make sure and have a do this again and, in another couple of weeks. And we're happy that you guys are tuning in. So thanks a lot, guys. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye bye.